everyone and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are very lucky to have Delena here with us and thank you Delena so much for, for joining us. Um, can you give us a, a brief overview of your background just so that we can get a little chance to know you a little bit better before we get into some questions? Sure. Um, I graduated with a degree in French and Spanish teaching from Brigham Young University and then a degree in second language acquisition from Ohio State University and I'm currently working on a PhD in instructional uh, psychology and technology from BYU. I have a background in education. I taught for 15 years both French and Spanish, both bricks and mortar and online and in Ohio and then moved back to Utah and they didn't have any online venues where I could teach and I was disappointed in that and looked around uh, for some options for myself professionally because I really liked the one-on-one -on -one instruction and the really tutoring feel that that provided for students and uh, I got a little sassy with a legislator who I didn't know at the time was involved in, long, in online learning um, and uh, he called me at 10 o'clock one evening and said hey I've got this opportunity for you. I need you to show up at a, a meeting at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. And I thought, you can't just call me at 10 o'clock at night and tell me to come to a meeting at 8 o'clock. Well, yes, he could. And he did. And I said yes and showed up. And it was one of the first meetings, uh, board meetings of the Open High School of Utah, which later changed its name to Mountain Heights Academy. Uh, and so I got to serve on the board for a year and then was asked to be the director as soon as the school opened. So that's a little bit of my professional background in history. I now have the job that I never knew I wanted uh, that turned into my dream job and I absolutely love it. Thank you so much. And so you mentioned that you're now working at Mountain Heights Academy and it really is known for um, being a premier online high school in Utah because it has high standardized test scores, um, and unparalyzed teacher interaction and personalized instruction. Um, what what do you think has really allowed for such success within the academy? Um, a couple of things really. The first one is the teaching model, and there are all sorts of different ways to do digital learning. The way that we have chosen to provide online instruction and digital learning for our students uh, is centered around uh, its student-centered instruction. And so what that looks like is we provide a laptop for each one of our students. We felt that, that removing that barrier to access was very important. So they each have their own laptop, our full-time students. They're able to log in. They access the curriculum, which is all open source content. So again, we, we, we removed another barrier. It's not proprietary. Um, they can access it. Uh, and then they work with their teachers who are available to them um, during their office hours. So, so the, the model that we set up was really about removing barriers for all of our students, whether it was access to technology, access to curriculum, or access to the teachers. And then what that looks like, and the reason why teachers go into teaching in the first place is to work with students. And in a bricks and mortar setting, it looks like is a teacher standing up in front of the classroom trying to broadcast teach to 30 students, teaching to the middle. And you hope that you're doing an effective job of it, and, and teachers do. In an online setting, that looks a little bit different. You have the ability to customize the student's experience. Um, and at our school, the content is placed online. The students can access that 24-7. And then if they run into trouble, then they can access their teacher individually and they can fill gaps uh, specifically for that student. And then what that does, it gives them access to data. The teachers have access to the data. The students have access to the data. They can see exactly what it is that they're missing and the teacher as the professional can come in and give them the tools that they need to be able to fill in those gaps. Um, and that creates a wonderful, uh, a wonderful mix for the the students and the teachers to be able to work together to figure out what, what needs to happen for them to move on. And because we have the open source content, then the teachers can go through and figure out, you know what, this content isn't doing the job that it needs to do. Let's swap it out or let's build something else that will do a better job of that. Uh, and then the students can be a little bit more successful as a result. So it seems like you have such a great personalized approach. Um, what kind of benefits have you seen from, from being able to create such an approach for students to learning? Well, 
the two things that we hear over and over from the six years that we've been doing this, from the parents, from the students, and from the teachers, they love the flexibility, first of all. They can pick up and take school wherever they want to. They take their laptops with them. We have students uh, all over the state of Utah, but they also travel all the world, and they, you know, a lot of them know what they want to do when they grow up, and they take their laptops with them, and they fit school in around their lives instead of the other way around. And that's a beautiful way to do school. That's a beautiful way to do a job for the teachers as well. So the flexibility is the number one thing that we that we hear um, as a benefit to being able to personalize the learning experience. The second thing that we hear is that being able to connect with teachers, that, that personalization of, of working with a teacher one-on-one -on -one or in small groups and interacting with the content as well, that they're able to leverage that and personalize that, you really, really enjoy being able to do that. So the flexibility and um, the connection with the teachers and the connection with the content. And um, really those are the biggest benefits that we see from being able to personalize the learning experience. Those are some great benefits. How, how do you work with the faculty to train them and to help them with communicating in a personalized way for students online? Uh, that's a great question. And we do a lot of, uh, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna use a medical analogy here. Uh, we do a lot, a lot of diagnostic up front, even before we hire our teachers. Uh, that hiring process is critical for us. We want to make sure that before they even come to us, they are, have the skill set that we need to be able to work with the students. They know what they're doing. Um, and so we, we send out uh, an email to all of our applicants. We want them to build content for us, include a video, so we can see what they look like. Uh, in their attempt to connect with student, students via video. So we do a lot of triage work up front. Um, and then we hire the best of the best, and we know that we're getting uh, teachers that already have the skill set that we're looking for, and that's critical to the success of our instructors, um, especially where personal learning is involved. Once we hire them, we provide ample training. They have mentors. They have department chairs. Uh, they know exactly where to go to get help. We also have a bank of tutorials that they can go to. Uh, and then we have live faculty meetings once once a, a month where they come in. And we do a lot of hands-on training with them as well uh, so that they get the tools that they need to be successful teachers in connecting with the students. So not only do the students get personalized instruction, but our faculty members get personalized professional development. And it's critical to model that for our faculty members so that they can then go model that and work with the students in the same manner that we're expecting um, from them. Um, and then we, we attend a lot of uh, local and uh, national conferences as well, so that they're getting broad layers of uh, professional development and, and a lot of mentoring so that they know exactly how to personalize the instruction for our students. It sounds like you really have given them personalized support as well, and I like that modeling aspect. So have you seen some strategies for student-to-instructor relationships when you think about like personalized interaction in the online classroom? Well, one of the, absolutely, and one of the, the best things that we can do as um, mentors and as faculty members is to document that. The ability that we have at our fingertips to use the data to connect with our students and um, to be efficient is fantastic, right? Uh, in a bricks and mortar setting, it's really hard to document everything and run down the hallway and say, hey, I gotta tell you about Joey because he's got this situation going on and even if you put that on pen and paper or even if you try and put that on the computer, there's not time during the day to be able to, to do that as effectively and as efficiently as we all want to as professional educators. But here online, we do have the time and the ability to do that. And so we do a lot of documentation. Um, if, if a teacher is working with a student, they can be simultaneously documenting, hey, here's what's going on with this kiddo. Another teacher who then works with that student, so they, they're working on math and, you know, they're, you know, things come out that they're struggling with, you know, um, uh, they're struggling with something, uh, something in their personal life, then they can share that. And all of the teachers and the counselor, uh, they, they can swarm that student and connect with them and give them the support that they need to be able to, uh, to, to have success. And a lot of our 
a lot of our success comes just because we're persistent with these kids and we stalk them. That's all it is. There's my, there's our secret. Now you know. <laughs> into success. Uh, we had an example <laughs> a couple of years ago. There was a kid who wasn't working, and we could not get a connection with this kid. He just he wouldn't work. He wouldn't. You know, we're calling the parent. We're trying all of the tricks. Nothing was was working with this kid. Um, and we're trying to shepherd them and foster relationships and, and cultivate any sort of connection that we can. And one of our teachers finally figured out that he showed prize chickens at a fair. Prize chickens. All right, so we put that into our database where we collect all of this information. And all of a sudden, the teachers are like, so, prize chickens at the fair. Fair. And he responds to that. And then all of a sudden he starts working in his classes because the teachers know that he raises prize chickens. We've also gone so far as to collect uh, cell phone information of girlfriends and figured out that with one of our students, if he texts his girlfriend, she'll kick him into shape and get him working. And, you know, it's just figuring out personalized learning, right? This is personalized learning. Figure out what the button is to push to get these kids working and how to connect with them. Uh, and that's that's one of the beauties of personalized learning is figuring that all out. But I think that we all really want to know that someone cares. Like, so I can see how that could really be a huge, huge benefit. Um, so when, when you look at adapting instruction, have you found any techniques or, or methods that work really well for group and individual needs for students? You know, we've had varied success with, with group instruction. Some of our teachers have really enjoyed the group work and the collaborative work um, and some of them you know they've tried it and it it's been a miserable failure uh, and so they've they've tried uh, they've tried a variety of things the same the things that seem to work the best are the ones where you can get student buy-in and investment uh, and it's their idea and they come up with the proposal and they submit it to the teacher and it uh, that's where it takes off so um, I, we've, we've just, we've, we continue to try to work with uh, collaborative projects and um, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. I think that's what a lot of faculty would say and I, I know from my own experience sometimes a collaborative project is phenomenal and then other times we really struggle to get it moving. The same class, just a different group of students. Yeah. So the students play a big role. Um, how, how do your teachers use principles of inclusive instruction in their teaching practices? Um, well, a, a lot of what, uh, what we've already talked about, it's, it's principles of caring and making sure that the students know that they're in a safe environment where we're connecting and validating and we know that we know who they are and that they care. One of the myths of online learning is that it's cold and sterile and um, that it's rote and automated and, and computer technology. Uh, and and we've, we've tried to create a culture of warmth and caring, and that's what gets communicated to these students. And what they know is, is that the, the teachers care about them. And, and what happens, you know, in a traditional setting where the teacher's standing up in front of a classroom trying to, trying to teach 30 students, um, you can very easily communicate that you care about the students because you're standing right there with them. But it takes a while to, to have a classroom uh, that you gel with, maybe October, November of the school year, right? What happens in, in our online setting is that you're talking one-on-one. -on -one. It's just you and the student, and you can very quickly form connections with these, with these students. A couple of the other things that we do um, for our strategies of inclusive instruction, we bring the students in to a face-to-face -face orientation right up front so that the teachers can see them in person and form that initial connection. And then we also have activities throughout the year, uh, social activities, we also have service learning activities, we have student body officers and elections and prom, and we try and wrap that, uh, that typical high school experience as the exterior of, of, their, of their social strata so that they have that experience that a, that a typical high school student would have as well. And then they get that individual inclusive instruction through their, their teaching strategies too. So we want to make sure that they have some great face-to-face -face activities and then um, that inclusive instruction that they're getting with their teachers uh, online. 
Thank you so much for sharing tips and strategies and things that have worked for you. Um, it's really been a great opportunity to talk with you and, and to learn more from you. You bet. Thanks for your time today.